In this lesson series, we're going to ask a question, why do we breathe? And we'll take a historical journey to try and seek an answer to that question. We're going to begin the story in ancient times with ancient thinkers. They had various proposals for why we breathe, but it won't be until more modern times that we have a good, solid scientific answer. And we are distinguishing modern science from the ancient thinkers. They were fantastic philosophers back 2,000 years ago, but they weren't doing what we call modern science. They weren't systematically testing ideas with experiments. Our first ancient thinker will be Anaximenes, and he proposed that breathing maintains life because it takes in a life-giving substance. Perhaps he was familiar with this interaction Sometimes violent interactions occur between humans, and sure enough that blocking respiration for long enough does extinguish life. So Anaximenes then is going to capture that in this claim. Breathing maintains life because it takes in a life-giving substance. We could rewrite that hypothesis in the form of A causes B. A life-giving substance causes life. But you might be thinking that's a bit unsatisfying. Philosophers would say that that proposal is minimally falsifiable. If an idea is falsifiable, it can be shown to be false. There's, there's some kind of observation or evidence that could weaken this claim. And there's very little that could weaken this claim. In fact, I mean, really the only thing that could weaken it would be that we find people who do not need to breathe to be alive. I mean, are there such people who don't breathe and yet are still alive? No. So beyond that, though, this hypothesis is not very specific. It doesn't tell us, it doesn't make any predictions. It doesn't tell us what we should find if we open up the human body and poke around inside. A little later in ancient times, uh, the philosophers Plato and Aristotle had various ideas about the function of breathing. Aristotle, for example, argued that the role of breathing was to cool the heart the heart produced a biological heat that was necessary for various life functions. And if we weren't breathing, then we weren't able to cool the heart. The heart might burn itself and go out. So respiration served as a cooling system for the heart. Now this is an improvement because it does make specific predictions that could be tested. For example, if we block, uh, block breathing, we would predict the heart would heat up because we have interfered with the cooling system. Of course, Aristotle didn't do that type of experiment, but at least this is a specific claim about the role of breathing. Sometime later in Roman times, the physician Galen was a very influential thinker. You see, he lived 129 AD to 216. Now, Galen was the physician to the gladiators, so he had the opportunity to investigate wounds to the body. But he also investigated the anatomy and physiology of animals. Galen's ideas would influence medical thinking for 14 centuries. Now again, he's in the camp of ancient thinkers, so they were not in the habit of systematically testing their ideas with experiments. And as we'll see, Galen got a lot of things wrong about the human body. For Galen, his understanding of the human body began with nutrition. So over on the uh, left here, we see a typical textbook diagram of some of the digestive organs. Food goes in the mouth and down the esophagus into the stomach. The contents of the stomach empty out into the small intestines. And it's here where our food is fully digested and then nutrients are absorbed into the blood. Undigested material goes through the large intestine and out. Now the nutrients that we absorb into our blood, there's a big vein that carries that blood from the intestines right to the liver. So Galen believed that the nutrients in our food then were converted into blood in the liver. So blood was made in the liver. Perhaps the color of the liver made him think of congealed blood. But uh, he, he believed that blood was synthesized in the liver. Now, we're going to use the diagram on the left here to capture a lot of Galen's thinking about the body. And first, uh, let's identify some of the organs, and then we'll get to these words here, right and left on the heart here. So up top, we have the brain here, and then we have the lungs here. We have the heart here in the middle, the liver here, and the intestines. Notice that big vein uh, that would be carrying blood that has nutrients from our food right to the liver. 
Now, on the heart, the word right and left appear to be written backwards. We have to think of this from the point of view of the person. So take a look at the mannequin over here on the right. This mannequin, the arm over here on our left, is the right arm of the mannequin. So the same in medical textbooks for the heart. So the, the, this side of the heart here is the right side of the heart from the patient's point of view. It's the left side of the heart from our point of view, but it's the right side of the heart from the patient's point of view, and then this would be the left side of the heart from the patient's point of view. So just don't get that mixed up. So you'll see this type of um, uh, marking in medical textbooks all the time. All right, in addition, uh, we should understand that Galen thought there were two kinds of blood. The blood in the veins indicated by the blue vessels here. So that blood, we'll say that's the blue blood in the veins. And then he thought there was a different kind of blood in the arteries, the red vessels here. And both of these blood vessel systems, both of these kinds of blood, the blue blood and the red blood, both reached all parts of the body. So the veins were carrying the one type of blood to all parts of the body, and the arteries were carrying a different kind of blood to all parts of the body. Now, ancient thinkers like Galen were correct to identify two colors of blood. Now, we'll see it's not really blue and red. It's more like a, a dark red and a brighter red, but we'll stick with the blue and the red distinction. Now, that is a distinction recognized by modern um, doctors and physicians and scientists, but the ancients were incorrect to claim that there were two different kinds of blood. As we'll learn, there's one kind of blood, but the color change is a result of the blood being sent to the lungs. There's a color change there. And then when the blood is sent around to the body, there's going to be another color change. And we'll get to that uh, later in this lesson series. So for right now, then, Galen has a system where um, he believes there's two different kinds of blood contained in the veins and the arteries. So let's go step by step through uh, sort of uh, Galen's understanding of how this whole system works. First of all, food is digested in the intestines and the nutrients are absorbed into the blood, which is sent to the liver where new blood was made from these nutrients. So down here in our diagram, here's the intestines and absorbed nutrients move through this vein to the liver and in the liver is this process where these nutrients are used to make fresh new blood. Now the blood acquired what Galen called natural spirits a substance needed by the body for nourishment and growth. So the natural spirits then were distributed by the veins and kept all the body's organs alive. Importantly, upon arriving at the heart, blood in the right side of the heart made its way to the lungs through a vessel here. And the purpose of that journey was just to nourish the lungs like every other part of the body. So for Galen, blood on the right side of the heart did make it to the lungs, but just the, that was the final destination there, just to nourish the lungs. Now, while blood in the veins was made in the liver, blood in the arteries had a different origin, the heart. So here we have the heart right here, and you'll notice the color difference here. On the right side, the blood is blue. On the, on the left side, the blood is red. So importantly, Galen believed that air from the lungs was delivered to the left side of the heart through a vessel connecting the lungs and the heart. On the left side of the heart, blood was mixed with air, giving the blood a new property called vital spirits. Vital spirits gave the warmth to the body and gave it the capacity to move. So here's our heart here and here are the lungs. Notice this tube connecting the lungs and the left side of the heart. Galen thought air was being delivered from the lungs to this chamber in the heart here to be mixed with blood. And that mixing produced a new substance in the blood that he called vital spirits. So notice the, there's a different color here too. So the blood with the vital spirits was reddish here and the arteries would be delivering the vital spirits to all parts of the body. And again, the vital spirits uh, gave warmth to the body and gave it the capacity to move extra energy to the different body parts. Blood reaching the brain was infused with animal spirits and the hollow nerves carried this substance to various body parts to generate movement and behavior animal spirits were needed to convert thought into action.
So the blood that reached the brain underwent uh, another transformation, giving it these animal spirits that allowed for thinking and moving and behaving. So let's look more closely at a key misunderstanding in Galen's thinking. Galen did not understand the relationship between the heart and the lungs. While blood from the right side of the heart went to the lungs to nourish them, he did not understand that blood returned to the heart on the left side. Here's Galen's system. Here's the heart here. We got the blood on the right side. It is indeed sent to the lungs. But Galen did not think the blood then returned from the lungs to the left side of the heart. He thought air was moving from the lungs to the left side of the heart. Now to appreciate this misunderstanding, um, we're going to compare Galen's system here with sort of a modern diagram. And we can call it Harvey's uh, sort of diagram but modern uh, scientists uh, embrace this. So notice here we have the heart and the lungs. And in this diagram, blood on the right side of the heart is pumped to the lungs, but the blood vessel that got the blood to the lungs is connected with a blood vessel that will bring the blood back to the left side of the heart. So in effect, the right ventricle, the right side of the heart is pumping blood through the lungs and the blood returns on the left side of the heart. Let's compare that to Galen over here. See, the right side of the heart, the blood goes to the lungs, but it's not blood that returns. It's air from when we're inhaling, we're breathing, we're sending air from the lungs down into the left side of the heart. So that's a major misunderstanding. But notice it poses a puzzle for Galen because if blood on the right side of the heart is not making its way through the lungs to go back to the left, how does blood get to the left side of the heart? Well, Galen did have an answer to that, and it's sort of depicted here. Let's uh, magnify the heart a little bit. Galen believed that there were holes in the wall that separated the right and the left side of the heart. This muscular wall is called the septum, and he believed that blood could move from the right side of the heart through these holes in the septum directly to the left side of the heart. Notice he was forced to propose this because he did not understand that blood was really being sent through the lungs to return on the left side of the heart. He had a puzzle. How did blood get to the left side? He thought it went right through the septum through these little holes. <clears throat> now to see this um, even in more detail, let's take a look at a typical diagram in a textbook of the heart and let's familiarize ourselves with the four chambers of the heart. The two upper chambers are called atria. Those are sort of collecting chambers, and then the pumping chambers are the lower chambers called ventricles. So we'll start over here with the right atrium. This uh, chamber collects blood from the body, and then the blood is moved down into the ventricle. The right ventricle is going to pump this blood to the lungs. Now, the blood doesn't just end its journey at the lungs. The blood is pumped through the lungs, as we'll see, through capillaries, and then into a larger blood vessel that brings the blood back to the heart, on the left side, here's the left atrium, would be collecting the blood after its journey through the lungs. And then the blood is sent down into the strong muscular uh, left ventricle. The left ventricle will pump this blood through this little valve out through this giant blood vessel called the aorta. And here we have the arteries that will be distributing the blood to the rest of the body. So the septum is this thick muscular wall between the two ventricles. Now, in the adult, there are no observable holes in this septum. There are actually holes in the infant's heart, but they then close up as the heart grows and matures. But in the adult, there are apparently no holes. You can't see them. They're not observable. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, Galen proposed that these holes were there. They were just invisible. They just could not be seen with the naked eye. So Galen was committed to this view that blood could move from the right ventricle through the septum, through these tiny invisible holes, into the left side of the heart. And that's how blood got to the left side of the heart. Well, William Harvey is going to put this idea to the test some 1,400 years later. But we'll get to that in due time. Let's end our discussion with Galen with uh, just sort of the general view of what the heart was doing for Galen. For Galen, the heart was more than a heating system that was cooled by air from the lungs, as Aristotle had proposed. The heart was rather the site of a refining process that required heat and air. 
blood was purified in the heart and given new qualities, the vital spirit, spirits needed by the body. And wastes from this purification process were then exhaled out the lungs. So notice then Galen is using a metaphor that we do not currently use in modern times. Galen thought the heart was a furnace. Of course, we moderns use a different metaphor. We say the heart is a pump. But for the ancients, the heart was a furnace. It was a, a, it generated heat, and then the blood was sort of being heated and mixed with air, and there was some kind of chemistry going on there that changed the blood, just as a furnace uh, involves uh, the combustion of whatever fuel you're, you're putting in there. The blood was undergoing this purification process, a refining process. Okay, let's summarize Galen's views of this system. First, we should note that Galen believed there were two different kinds of blood. The blood in the veins, which was carrying natural spirits, and the blood in the arteries, carrying the vital spirits. But here are a couple more points to, to know. Blood in the veins was made in the liver, right? So nutrients from the intestines were delivered to the liver, and the liver was making new, fresh blood. The right ventricle allowed some of the blood to make its way up to the lungs for nourishment only. Blood sent to the lungs did not return back to the heart on the other side of the heart. Three, holes in the septum allowed blood to move from the right ventricle to the left. So this is how Galen explained how blood got on the left side of the heart. It wasn't coming from its journey through the lungs. It was going right through the septum through tiny invisible holes. Air from the lungs goes to the heart, so that's what the lungs are doing, providing air that is directly delivered down into the left side. The air then mixes with blood in the left ventricle, and the arteries carry this purified blood. So now the blood has vital spirits, and the arteries deliver the vital spirits to all the different parts of the body. And then importantly, the great metaphor for the ancient thinkers, including Galen, was the heart is a furnace. Now the purpose of understanding lots of these wrong ideas is to have a greater appreciation of the advances made by people with the scientific spirit like William Harvey as we'll see in the next lesson.